Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 7.03, and here we are at the uh, regularly scheduled Beloit City Council meeting at 100 State Street, Beloit, Wisconsin, uh, for Monday, June 4th, uh, 2012. Uh, first item is a call to order and roll call. Madam Clerk. Uh, roll call shows all councilors present except for councilors DeForest and Levy. Number two is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Three special orders of the day and announcements. Uh, these will, will be presented by Vice President uh, Spritzer. Is Alex Molland here to come forward? A certificate of achievement to present to Alex Molland in recognition of his election as Region 5 Vice President for Future Business Leaders of America. As Regional Vice President, Mr. Molland will host the 2013 Regional Leadership Conference, which will include competitive events, a general session, special interest sessions, and an awards program, bringing honor and prestige to the City of Beloit, presented this fourth day of June 2012. Congratulations. Is Julie Rounds here? A proclamation of the City of Beloit, recognizing Julie Rounds for earning the honor of first place at the Future Business Leaders of America State Leadership Conference. Whereas it is the mission of the School District of Beloit to provide an education appropriate to each student in order for students to become productive learners and successful citizens in the world community, and whereas the City of Beloit recognizes the important role that quality education plays in creating a high quality of life in the city, and whereas Future Business Leaders of America is the largest business career student organization in the world, and whereas FBLA is a professional business organization dedicated to bringing business and education together in a positive working relationship through innovative leadership and career development programs, and whereas members perform community service activities and strive to build a student's understanding of the realities of the modern business world, and whereas FBLA teaches middle school, high school, and and college student business and leadership principles and assists in the transition from school to work and whereas due to Ms. Round's dedication she earned both the honor of first place in the introduction to business test at the state FBLA competition and the opportunity to represent the state of Wisconsin and the city of Beloit at the FBLA National Leadership Conference. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the city of Beloit is proud to honor Julie Rounds for her outstanding academic achievements and the distinct honor to represent the state of Wisconsin at the national conference. Presented this fourth day of June 2012, Charles M. Haynes, Council President. And do we have Jesse Porter? Um, another official proclamation of the City of Beloit recognizing Jesse Porter for earning the honor of second place at the Future Business Leaders of America State Leadership Conference. Whereas it is the mission of the School District of Beloit to provide an education appropriate to each student in order for students to become productive learners and successful citizens in the world community, and whereas the City of Beloit recognizes the important role that quality education plays in creating a high quality of life in the city, and whereas FBLA is the largest business career student organization in the world, and whereas FBLA is a professional business organization dedicated to bringing business and education together in a positive working relationship through innovative leadership and career development programs, and whereas members perform community service activities and strive to build a student's understanding of the realities of the modern business world, and whereas FBLA teaches middle school, high school, and college students business and leadership principles and assists in the transition from school to work, and whereas due to Mr. Porter's dedication, he earned both 
the honor of second place in the Introduction to Business Test at the State FBLA competition and the opportunity to represent the State of Wisconsin and the City of Beloit at the FBLA National Leadership Conference. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City of Beloit is proud to honor Jesse Porter for his outstanding academic achievements and the distinct honor to represent the State of Wisconsin at the National Leadership Conference. Presented this fourth day of June 2012, Charles M. Haynes, Council President. Is there someone to accept the proclamation for? One of the other two take that off. Thank you. Number four is public hearings. Item A. A resolution authorizing a conditional use permit to allow a single family dwelling in a C2 neighborhood commercial district for the property located at 1007 Prairie Avenue. Planning Commission recommended approval 5 to 0. Ms. Christian. Um, the applicant um, who applied for the conditional use intends to finalize the purchase of this property on June 6th pending the decision on the conditional use. Um, if approved, he plans to use the property as a mixed-use building with one dwelling on the upper level and then sales-oriented retail on the lower level. The sales-oriented retail is permitted by right, but the residential requires a conditional use permit. This property is located on a corner lot at the intersection of Prairie Avenue and Woodard Avenue and was formerly used as a mixed-use building with the Beloit Dental Lab on the lower level and a single-family dwelling unit on the upper level. However, that use was discontinued, with, which required the conditional use to be established because it never had one before. Um, the upper and lower levels of the building have two separate access entries from a vestibule. Um, essentially, what he's intending to do is rent the upper unit um, and then he would eventually establish a retail sales use. He had indicated at Planning Commission at that at this point he didn't have the retail use ready to go. He was hoping to do a clothing store or something with like Western wear. Um, we, this, the code does require um, five parking stalls for these uses. Um, it is two off-street park parking spaces for the single-family residential uses and then one off-street parking space for every 250 square feet for a total of five. There is currently an attached garage and a detached garage, as well as some terrace parking there, so he does meet the parking requirements of code. We did send this out to the review agents, and none of the review agents had any concerns. We did send out a public notice to 17 nearby neighboring property owners. We were contacted by one of the neighboring property owners who's concerned about the type of business and was opposed if it was not owner occupied, if it was a rental property. That person didn't come to the Planning Commission meeting, but he did indicate that over the phone. Planning Commission did hold a public hearing and did recommend approval subject to the conditions which are listed in your resolution, which is that this conditional use permit authorizes a single family dwelling within the upper level of the existing building located at 1007 Prairie Avenue. The applicant shall obtain and retain an annual rental dwelling permit while the conditional use is established and maintained. The applicant shall obtain an architectural review certificate and or sign permit prior to any proposed exterior alterations and or the establishment of outdoor signage for the property located at 1007 Prairie Avenue. And then just our standard condition about any major changes coming back through this public process and minor changes being able to be approved administratively by staff. And Planning Commission to recommend approval 5-0. Thank you. This is a public hearing for, for authorizing condition use at uh, property located at 1007 Prairie Avenue. Does anyone wish to speak on this matter? Second call for anyone to speak on the conditional use uh, to allow uh, residential and C2 commercial district. And final third call. Anyone do wish to speak on this matter? Hearing none, I'll look for for a uh, motion. Second. Motion by Van Bogart, second by Luki. Councillor Kincaid. No. No, no questions? Okay. And you, your light is lit as well. Do uh, you have a question? Okay. All right. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, uh, we'll call the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Matter passes 5-0.
Number five, citizens' participation. We have reached the point in the agenda for citizens to speak to the Council about issues that are coming before us or may come before us in the future. Councilors may not act on any request at this meeting, but we may refer to the speaker to a staff for assistance. We ask that you hold your comments to three minutes or less and refrain from personal attacks of any kind. I have a number uh, of this today, so, so I would imagine we're going to need to be as brief as possible. I think the first person coming up on my list is uh, Steve Miller. You should speak. Thank you. Uh, uh, again, my name is Steve Miller. I live at 2275 Cobblestone in Beloit. Um, I'm here tonight just uh, to show my support for the bicycle races that are coming up in July or that they're looking at doing. I just, uh, as a, a citizen here in Beloit, I think it's a, it's a good thing. I am a bike rider anyway, but I do think it is a good thing for the community. I think it, it sheds some spotlight on our community. Uh, I travel for my job throughout Wisconsin and always trying to speak highly of things we do and I think this is something where we can uh, bring people in, showcase what we have, showcase our downtown and bring in business, uh, bring in business of the hotels and the restaurants and things. So uh, I believe it's a, a good thing for our community. Um, I am on vacation that week uh, up north and we'll come back for the day if we, we have the races here because I, I believe uh, in what it is and, and what we're doing here for the community. So. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak here on this, and uh, I really look forward to, to your support on this. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Rick Barter. Rick Barter, 2560 Barney Stone uh, Drive in Beloit. I would just like to uh, echo uh, Steve's uh, comments about support of the bike race. It's, it's a one-day event. It's very important to understand. On Thursday, July 12th, uh, I am also a member of a group uh, called the State Line Spinners. It's a local cycling group in Beloit. You'll see us uh, running around our spandex on Tuesday nights and uh, Saturday mornings. Uh, we've been in existence about uh, 10 years, and um, it's a very successful group, and I know I speak for a lot of the members of that group that would like to see this event happen. Um, as Steve said, it's a great opportunity to showcase our community. Uh, other cities uh, our size, Kenosha has uh, one, for example, has supported supported this event and, and found it to be uh, uh, very successful. It's a short time frame. I know it's going to be a little bit of scrambling on the part of the city, but it's a turnkey operation and uh, I think it's something that the, the council and the community should consider very seriously. Uh, I also speak for Betsy Smeechin from the villager who couldn't be here tonight and, and she's she's traveled to see these events in other cities herself. And she'll, so she as a, as a local business person wanted me to speak on her behalf uh, for this event. So thank you very much and I uh, hope that uh, this event can happen and, and, and happen not only this year, uh, but uh, for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Walter Luz. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. Uh, I'm actually uh, the owner of Paddle and Trail, uh, located at 110 West Grand. Um, and as uh, many of the comments already spoken tonight, I just think that this would be a great event for the downtown community. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, we chose to uh, open our store here was to sort of be uh, able to show people and and uh, highlight the many great national assets that are here in Beloit. And a um, bike race of this magnitude I think would be great for the community. It is a full community event as uh, you'll hear in the later presentation on tonight. But uh, I'd just like to echo that hopefully you would consider uh, the opportunity to host this race. I think it'd be a great thing for Beloit and the surrounding area. So thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. Mr. Richard Thompson. I am Richard Thompson. 
We have a business at 108 West Grand called Totally Tan. We've been there 14 and a half years. We have six employees, and every day we put on an average of 100 to 150 people through our store each day. And if, if we lost our off-street on-street parking, half of these people couldn't get there because we have a lot of handicapped, we have elderly clients, no way they can climb steps. And that's why I'm, I like to see business come to Beloit, but they would shut us down completely for one day. Thank you. Michael uh, Mark Larson, Lairdon, and yeah, Garrison. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Michael Garrison, thanks for having us tonight. I'm the marketing director for the International Cycling Classic. And um, it's a great opportunity for us not only to showcase what we've done for 44 years, is having an international event here in Beloit but also brand Beloit, meaning throughout our 17-day event, each coast community we actually do a branding sponsorship for, with signage on the course, announcements, promoting Beloit, talking about all the improvements that you've done over the years. I haven't been back here um, up until several weeks ago when I came in to have meetings. It's been a long time, and I'm just really impressed with uh, what the city's done here, um, everybody that lives here should be proud of what Beloit's done. And this is just an ability for us to not only showcase an event here, but also showcase your community um, throughout our ability in front of 400,000 spectators in 17 different uh, city centers. And um, you know, I'll get into more detail later if need be, but um, basically we're going to be bringing in riders from about 20 countries, Olympians, world champions, it's the oldest, longest multi-category event, and it's known around the world also as Super Week. So just wanted to keep it brief, but thanks again for allowing me to speak tonight. And if uh, we go forward with this, we really look forward to uh, being part of the community. Thank you. We have uh, on Andy. Uh, oh, okay. He, he spoke well for you. Okay. All right, next, uh, Kurt Hanrich. Um, Kurt Hendrick, I live at 740 Grant Street. And uh, actually, unlike my fellow spinners, I did wear my bike and you down rode my bike here. And so I do want to share my support for the Super Week bike race. But I'm actually here to, to speak on chickens for Beloit Backyard Chickens, and many of our folks couldn't be here tonight, being the end of the school year and getting ready, but they wanted me to come and share our thanks for the workshop and working with us on that. Um, we had a great joy on Saturday, a number of us going to Madison for their city coop, uh, chicken coop tour. Saw lots of different types of coops and chickens and eggs, and I got really excited. In fact, um, Mr. President, I was thinking of you because one gentleman was sharing that his landlord wouldn't let him have dogs, but he was able to have chickens and bees. So if you go to my site, you can check out the coops. And and the beehives. So, um, so we're, we were very excited, and part of the excitement was simply the fact of knowing that there was a great openness to be able to work, work together to find a way that the concerns of everyone who wants and may not be as excited about this are able, you know, to work together and find a path. And that by able, by going up there, we were actually looking at what we're very hoping, very much hoping to be our future. So, um, I only f conclude by saying one of the families there shared they started in August, and by February they had eggs. And so our hope is, you know, I know things are on your agenda, but perhaps timing might work out that our first fruits could be. A Christmas gift to all of you. Thank you. Uh, Corky uh, Neuschwander. Corky Neuschwander from Evansville, Wisconsin. Looking for some land to purchase in the corner of Willowbrook and um, State Line Road to put a truck wash in. And I heard Norm Paulson of Paulson Kendall build it. I told him to ask one of his people that he uses with the city if it was owned properly. He said yes it was. But then he forwarded it to uh, Andrew Janke. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not. 
and he states that they would not allow that in there. They're going to save it for manufacturing or retail, and that's because they don't understand their decision on that, being the economy the way it is, and unemployment in this city. I would probably have, I'd start off with 12 employees full time, uh, six part time, and if the need is for another bay, I'd add that add on, so I'd be doubling the employees. Uh, let's get started on as soon as possible. So, might, if it would go, if your policy would change on that land, because the city's owned it for over 10 years, if not more, nothing's been there yet. So, you think you'd let something be built in that area? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dave Fargerud. <laughs> I just want to thank all of you for letting me address the council. I haven't been here for a long, long time, but uh, anyway, I want to address this to all of you guys and all of the city officials and the citizens of this great community. I am Pastor Dave Fogdrude from the Overflowing Cup. We're located at 310 State Street here in downtown Beloit, and um, proud to have been in this part of this great community for 38 years. But anyway, uh, I just have two issues I'd like to just draw to your attention tonight. I really didn't think it was necessary to get on the agenda. If you could possibly bring these to the attention of the right people later, and then somebody could get back to me, that'd be great. Um, um, first of all, I want to thank Roger Bryden, who donated to us on December 31st of 2010, the old granary over here. You've seen our sign up there, and people are wondering just what we're doing or what we're planning to do. It's not too far from City Hall, actually, here. Um, anyway, uh, Roger donated that to us, and uh, um, it, and it's at 232 Sherland. And this will, became our property, all filed uh, legally, on December 31st of 2010. And we filled out all the necessary paperwork to get it off the tax rolls. Part of our property is in Beloit, Wisconsin, and the uh, property to the back is in Winnebago County, or the state of Illinois. So we filled out all the paperwork for them as well. They had no trouble in approving our tax exemption based on everything that I shared with them and all the proper paperwork. And, I, and uh, so we are off the tax rolls on the Illinois side of the road, uh, effective January 1st of 2011. Well, I went to the Beloit City uh, Department and uh, and uh, without ever calling me or asking to see it or anything, um, they actually denied. They denied. Now, let me jump ahead and say, after a little bit of time went on, the assessor came over and looked and graciously recognized that we really are using it for what we say we're using it for. And effective of January 1st of 2012, it's off the tax roll. So that's not my issue. Uh, they do recognize that we're legitimately off the tax roll. However, the problem is that gap from January of 2011. So we got a tax bill for $3,700 from the Beloit City. And um, <clears throat> they said, well, uh, you know, you weren't using it on January 1st. Well, that was a holiday. And we just got the property. Uh, it takes time to make it ready. We went in there a few days later and found out the water pipes had broken and it's freezing cold. And uh, so it just took a little bit of time, and yet I filled out all the proper paperwork within the proper boundaries of time. So I'm asking that um, you folks somehow would, oh, first of all, the assessor said he has no power to forgive that $3,700 bill. We certainly don't have the money to pay it, and um, so I'm asking that somebody would simply forgive that or however you want to call it, wipe it off the record, the, the bill that was issued to us for taxes for the year of 2011. That's my issue on that. And just remove it from the tax roll. It is off the tax roll now, but it would be a blessing if you could somehow just acknowledge that, look, we should have made it retroactive to January 1st of 2011. Certainly will appreciate you guys uh, dealing with that. Second issue is a little more current. Um, um, and I invite you all to come and make an appointment. We'll show you a property. I hope we never have police calls like they used to have when it was a bar. You know, this is going to be a great place for Beloit. We're going to have live music and church services and everything else so in the future. Right now, we're using it as a donations distribution center. And uh, 
Part of our ministry is to give stuff away. We furnished numerous apartments for people that had nothing. Uh, I got a call this week from somebody who needs a large bed. You know, we won't charge them. They're disabled people sleeping on the floor. I mean, and bed comes in, we, we send it out when we can. That's what we do. Um, anyway, I wanted to say that um, <laughs> we didn't know we were doing anything wrong, so we had had a couple of sales out on our, our property on Sherwin Avenue, 232 Sherwin Avenue. And uh, we get a violation notice from the city just last week. I'd already put an ad in the paper for another one here. So we wasted that 20 bucks, but um, we, we honored their comments that they didn't want us to do it. But I want to ask you to look into that uh, uh, ordinance that's referred to in the letter. I don't see where that ordinance applies to a church or a nonprofit ministry. It, for whatever reason I'm not here to discuss it as far as residential areas maybe there's a good reason not to have more than two rummage sales a year or whatever it is three a year or whatever they've got for the but in our case we want to have one at least once a month when we need to or when we can like the first weekend yes sir and the three minutes are up yeah, if, you, if, you, if you could make uh, wrap up your yeah, time. That, that's it. Those are the two issues. So if somebody would address that and uh, give us, allow us to have a simple sale, it's a blessing to the community, and it allows us to move ahead with our project. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from somebody. Thanks. And um, Mike Zorl. Noticed on the agenda today that you're looking to borrow five million dollars in new money. And while there's nothing wrong necessarily with borrowing money to get your projects done, and interest rates are at historic lows right now, they won't always be that way. And the only thing that's keeping interest rates low right now are the problems over in Europe. Uh, everybody's focused on their problems, and money is flowing out of Europe coming to the United States as a safe haven. It's keeping interest rates low here. So if you do decide to go ahead and borrow all this money, the only thing I'd ask you to do is start looking at uh, some sustainable ways going forward in the future where you're not going to have to depend on borrowed money to pay the bills and do your projects. Maybe start setting aside some money so that not all of that is borrowing and eventually get it down to zero. Uh, second thing I want to mention was uh, I want to second those comments on the yard sales. I think the limit of two per year is absolutely ridiculous. Thanks. That, that, those are all the sheets I have. Is anybody else wishing to come forward and, and uh, speak today? Please approach the podium. Please state your name and address. Hi, my name's Tom Houlihan. I'm at 1729 Kenwood, and I'd like to come here to talk about the, the bike race. I am in favor of it. I'm an avid bicyclist. I ride with the state line spinners, and I had also talked to Rod at Austin Barber, and he was positive about the bike race, too, even though <coughs> it might cause a problem because of the Main Street being shut down, but he figured people could come in the back and it wouldn't be too much of an inconvenience for him. So, and I think it'd be a good thing to promote Beloit and it'd be a, probably a good day for a lot of the businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, sir, uh, state your name and approach the podium and, and give, uh, give your address. My name is Ken Pearson. I represent the Janesville Velo Club. We're uh, here to support the uh, bike race you're, you're talking about having downtown. We plan on, su on uh, supplying several volunteers and helping to, to uh, have that event come off um, successfully. Uh, we also work with the uh, state light spitters on some of our events and, so, and get together. So uh, we're, uh, I, I live in Janesville at this time. So. So I'd like to put, we'd like to, uh, as the club as a whole, like to support that and encourage you to carry through with that. Thank you. Thank you. Please, sir, state your name and address and approach the party. 
Hi, my name is Michael Norton, and I live at 1778 Gateway here in Beloit. Um, I would just like to say that I am in favor of the bicycle race. I'm a retired professional cyclist. I've traveled around the world and done this for over 22 years. I know that the impact that it brings in on local communities, I've seen it firsthand all over the United States. And uh, I'm a big player, I guess, if you will, in trying to come and bring this here, uh, working with Super Week and also the local communities. Uh, the main intent for this uh, is to help downtown business and also the residential area of Beloit to showcase what we've done here in Beloit um, to not only the surrounding states but also to the world. So I'd just like to show my favor for the bike race. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the council? Seeing none, I think we can move on to uh, number six. This is the consent agenda. All items listed in the consent agenda are considered routine and will be enacted with one motion. There are no separate discussions of these items unless the council member so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered at this point in the, on the agenda. Would any councilor wish to have anything removed from the uh, uh, consent agenda? Hearing none, the consent agenda consists of items 6A through uh, 6N. I have a motion uh, to approve. Motion for approval. Second. Motion by Lukey, second by Spritzer. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item number seven is ordinances. There are none. Item eight, appointments. There are none as well. So now on to item nine, councilor activities and upcoming events. Councilor Van der Bogart. Uh, not a whole lot to report other than the usual uh, opportunity to walk in the Memorial Day Parade, uh, attending a number of uh, uh, meetings and workshops. And then uh, I'd also like to take this chance or this opportunity to thank all of the uh, the poll workers who will be working tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night uh, as we uh, complete the second of a number of elections that we'll be dealing with here in Wisconsin this year. So those folks are uh, front and center in terms of the democracy process that we're working through and uh, we're going to put in a big day and uh, a big season for us. So thank them. Councilor Kincaid. I found myself on um, uh, across from uh, Rod's Barbershop on Saturday, not to get a haircut, but I saw somebody painting the facade or uh, painting a, a picture of the facade. Turned out it was someone who, uh, a woman who had entered the uh, um, the river uh, downtown riverfront uh, art uh, uh, event. And she's from out of town, and I kind of she kind of appreciated the and, and we're seeing things that most of us don't see when we we see it every two weeks maybe, uh, but uh, it uh, and then uh, then I went up to uh, the um, uh, the Angel Museum. Another out of town artist was painting uh, there, uh, uh, in a, a beautiful scene that I'd never noticed from uh, before. So uh, it, uh, it, it's a good program where we, uh, folks are coming in from, uh, from here in Beloit, from uh, throughout Wisconsin, northern Illinois. Uh, next Friday, they'll be having a uh, uh, presentation of everything over at uh, Visit Beloit. Uh, some people win prizes. Some people will, um, won't. Uh, and the, uh, pr uh, the, the, some of the art will also be for sale. So it's a, it's a great thing, and uh, I suggest uh, uh, you think about uh, showing up. Councilor Lukey. I want to thank the Finnegan family again for the vets for all. Uh, it was, uh, we got a notice, I think, from the city manager that a number of people from around the state complimented Beloit on what a wonderful city we have here, and that's just, it's great to hear. But the, the whole thing was, was wonderful, and the Finnegans deserve a, a great deal of praise for what they've done. I, too, was in the parade with the other counselors, and there's a lot of pride came forth in me as I crossed over the, uh, the creek down there and into Beloit and saw the thousands of people who came out on that beautiful, warm Monday, Memorial Day. So it, just a, another great parade. I um, want to remind people, as... Uh, Jim Benny Bogart did to vote tomorrow. Very important election, so uh, there should be no excuse for 
everybody not voting. Mike, you can only vote once now. Just once is enough. Um, and uh, and I want to thank our, our friends from Janesville to come down and uh, we're coming down to help us support. We've talked about collaboration, about teamwork, about working together with surrounding communities. And this is a prime example. So thank you and um, hope we can have some reciprocity in the future. And Mr. Barter, next time you come, please wear a suit and tie or your spandex when you present. You'll impress us more. <laughs> okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Councilor Spicer. Well, I don't know how to follow that those comments, but uh, I also walked in the Memorial Day Parade and uh, had a great time there. And uh, this Saturday, I participated in the Port Area Watch Group Neighborhood Cleanup and the Sharing Garden Work Day, so had a great opportunity working with some of the people there and cleaning up the neighborhood. After that, I don't, I can't possibly follow that up, so we'll go ahead and say none today. Um, the next is item number 10, uh, the City Manager's presentation. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And while Beth Jacobson is coming to the microphone, I just wanted to quickly comment <coughs> that uh, this Super Week is a series of races, as you heard earlier. Beth is going to give you a report on the update of planning to date. Uh, the purpose for placing this on the agenda tonight, because we're doing this on a fairly tight time frame, is we wanted to be sure the council and the community was fully aware of this event. It has tremendous potential for downtown, uh, yet we know people are going to have concerns. It's our first year, so we have no real experience with this, although fortunately uh, BAP has worked on a number of these, uh, this same type of race in the past. So she's helping us put all of this thing together. Uh, I think with that, uh, Mr. President, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Beth, let her report. Also, we did anticipate that some of the organizers who are here this evening would speak uh, as part of this report and presentation tonight. Some of you got up earlier, and that's great, but uh, Beth will, will kind of call on you as we need you to come up, answer questions, provide a little more detail about the event and its potential impact on downtown Beloit. So Beth, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. So um, my staff report, you guys have all had time to read it, but based on the number of people, I'll maybe try to go through it briefly. Um, a little bit of history, um, Walter Luce and uh, Michael Norton, who came up earlier, they approached um, sort of the city, but kind of the city of Beloit, not necessarily just us, the government, um, about hosting a one-day professional um, bike event. And um, as Mike explained he's a retired cyclist and so he has these contacts with the gentleman at Breakway that put on um, Super Week. The bike tour that would be in Beloit would be part of Super Week, which is a 17-day um, bike event, which is in 14, I think I read it was in 14 different cities, or 17, I'm not sure, this year. Um, it is sanctioned by U.S. Cycling, which um, which you should know is important. It's the national governing body for cycling in the United States, so this isn't something that's um, it's not like an amateur that just does this for fun. It, it is sanctioned. Um, like, like um, who was it? Um, Andy, I think he said, um, or Mike, uh, Michael Garrison said, it's one of the longest running multi-category um, cycle races in the world. And by multi-category, it means um, there's professionals to what I would call um, people that take it more seriously than amateurs, um, people that actually like to race, um, race and not necessarily just um, ride their bike on the weekends. Um, and as they stated, both national and international cyclists would be here in, in the city of Beloit cycling, which um, you know is a, I think is a great spotlight for the city of Beloit. Um, staff has discussed the event. Our biggest concern at the city of Beloit is the street closure. And today we met with um, Mike and Andy Garrison from um, Super Week or from Breakaway Sports, and they've actually um, gave us a lot more information than we knew up until this evening. Um, it will impact downtown businesses, um, and that's why we're bringing it to you. Um, the Downtown Latest uh, Business Association is aware of it. Um, the organizers have been in contact with merchants down there. I, I couldn't speak for any merchant that hasn't spoken for themselves. Um, and so that's something that you'll have to determine. Um, there's a couple of the issues I'll go through, even though it's in my staff report, just so that we all know. Um, the event um, will have an impact downtown. There'll be parking issues. It will, if you um, if you can turn in your packet, there is a map. Um, I provided a map of where the route is, and you'll see that it actually cuts off to um, two large 
parking lots um, in the city of Boyd that we think that we can actually maneuver around. We think that we'll be able to allow some cars to move in and out um, either during the race or in between the race. Um, certainly based on the distance and and if it's a pro race, they're going to be riding much faster than, um, you know, the Cat 5 guys. But um, we think that we can accommodate some of the parking downtown in, in those parking lots after our conversation today. You will notice that um, this does cross Highway 51 and 213, and so there will be some detours, which seems to be the biggest um, challenge for us at this point. Um, because, as you know, Henry Avenue Bridge is out. These are two bridges, and then also... They are state highways, which means we have to post detours. Um, certainly, um, it's difficult um, because breakaway promotions is puts on the event, um, and the city does it, and so we have to work together so that they're closing the streets um, for the safety of the riders, and then we need to focus on closing the streets for the safety of, of our drivers. Um, not that we don't care about the cyclists, but that's that's kind of the way that we've looked at it at this point. Um, US, USA Cycling does require cyclists to sign waivers, and so um, the insurance issues should be resolved um, with that. You know, if, if someone trips on the street, we probably will hold the same liability that we do any other day of the week, but um, we won't be taking out the insurance. And for the detour, we would um, receive um, some sort of certification of insurance from breakaway. Um, the city's engineering department will coordinate with the um, state DOT. If this, in fact, goes through, we can close State Street, and as we have several times in the past. But as for closing the actual highways, um, our engineering department submits an application. They basically approve the detour, and then someone else will post it. Either the city would be responsible or the promoters of the event. Um, someone will have to pay for that. Um, we are concerned. Um, because we're not used to cyclists, just having motorists get used to seeing um, that number of cyclists around. Certainly if they're racing, they'll be on the course, but as people warm up, I'm sure they'll be downtown, and we just want to make sure that everyone is really um, cautious, which includes drivers and cyclists. Um, the other thing is that this, this would highlight downtown businesses in a positive way. They're expecting hundreds of participants, and with that, hundreds of spectators. Um, hopefully, um, there would be a positive economic impact. Um, any cyclist in town or a family member or spectator would certainly be eating, um, enjoying themselves in Beloit, possibly staying in Beloit, and so we see that as a positive impact. One of the things... Um, that the city of Boyd always does is that we always support the Downtown Business Association, Visit Boyd, and other events that highlight the city of Boyd in a positive way. And um, that's just one other thing I put in my staff report. Um, the only possible budgetary impact is um, any staff time that we use it. Um, street sweeping, we've talked to Public Works, and um, Chris Walsh is committed to st um, making the street um, for the cyclists in the room. I'm sure you can appreciate that we will street sweep the streets so that um, there won't be gravel or anything else that will make it dangerous for the riders. Breakaway will um, close the streets. They're going to do the basic street closure for the race, and they'll also secure anything that's... Um, anything that could injure a cyclist while they're riding or if they crash, um, which will probably happen. Uh, be, be just based on the size and scale of this event, we thought that we should bring it before you guys. And um, certainly you can direct questions from the city's point of view to me if you'd like. Otherwise, I would be happy to introduce you to um, the guys um, from Breakaway or Walter or Michael or whoever you'd like to discuss. Thank you. And Mr. President, why don't we open it to councilor questions at this point, right. and uh, hopefully between Beth and the organizers, we should be able to answer, I think, all of your questions this evening. Uh, yes, can you describe the, the, the racers themselves? Who are they? Are these development teams for people who are moving toward uh, professional cycling as a career, or, or are they bicycle manufacturers sponsoring teams or where do these people come from what are their classes and how many races are you going to have I mean what I don't know a lot about this process so. sure yeah once again my name is Michael Norton and I'm a resident of Beloit um, but yeah uh, basically uh, there's 
offhand, there's probably about 10 different races, male and female, they are separate. Um, what we like to call them is weekend warriors, so they all take this very seriously. There's age categories as well as youth categories, so people will come of all different magnitudes and levels, people that are fully sponsored that look like NASCAR, um, other people that show up in a, you know, a minivan and hop out, they are going to come from all over. Um, but uh, yeah, looking at it, you have uh, all sorts of age categories, uh, all the way up to professional ranks. You have what's called beginner or category five. Uh, really what that is, is you take out a one-day license at a minimum through USA Cycling, and you go and you race. Uh, after that point, you have to get categorized to go up to four, three, two, and one, and then professional. So you kind of work your way up. Um, all these people uh, are very, I would say, at a, at a whole, they're family oriented. They're all usually uh, run their own businesses. They all own at least a $4,000 bicycle. Um, so they're business people. They're, it's, a, it's a great target market for a community. Um, and that's kind of why the idea is to bring it here. Is that? Well, so it's not just a developmental racing program for for the Olympics or for uh, well, or something? No, and it could be viewed that way. Right now, I believe we have about four Olympians that will go straight from Beloit to the London Games that will come here and be represented, um, which is huge. They are actually using it as possibly like a developmental race to prepare for London. Um, other people, they take all their vacation time and plan it for July to come do this race series. So. Um, some of it, it's their Tour de France, if you will, which is the Super Bowl of cycling. Um, or other people, it's uh, a stepping stone to get to a bigger event, such as the London Olympics. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, today they went over kind of a list of where a lot of the cyclists were coming from. <clears throat> They'd be coming to Beloit from all over the world. That's I don't correct. know if you or Mr. Garrison could give us a quick thumbnail. It doesn't have to be down to the precise count, but kind of where all these people are coming from. Sure. Yeah, this is uh, Andy Garrison. Hi, it's Andy Garrison. Uh, I was just going to say uh, we have local, regional, uh, national, and international riders. And uh, so far, we have uh, five women and five men coming from the Columbia national team. We have seven riders coming from uh, excuse me, South Africa. We have five riders coming from Germany, three riders coming from Germany. And uh, we always get people that, you know, show up from all over. So we haven't gotten confirmation yet because we won't know until they register. But uh, last year we had people from Taiwan and Australia and New Zealand and uh, China and, uh, you know, all over. Mexico. It's my understanding uh, some of the Mexican national team is coming and another team from Mexico. So it's quite interesting, especially if after the race or before the race they have dinner, go out for coffee or, uh, you know, kind of uh, sit around in their kits, which is their spandex outfits, uh, you know, uh, before or after the race. Uh, it's interesting that usually they talk to people and I think it's a very good way to showcase the community. You want to talk a little bit about the number of riders that you're expecting, sure. the, the possible number of spectators that would be in downtown sure. for that day? Yeah, we're expecting a minimum of 500 riders. Uh, this is a big biking community, so is Janesville, so is Madison. This whole area has a lot of bikers. So it's a possibility we could have as many as 800 plus. So, uh, you know, because this is a first year event, it's more difficult to know exactly uh, what's going to happen. Uh, as far as spectators, a lot of these riders that ride throughout the day, their friends and family uh, will come watch them ride. And uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, there's, rider there's people that will follow the races, like they'll hear there's a race in Beloit, so they'll come up here to check it out. Uh, and then throughout the day, people on their lunch hours or they see what's going on, they'll stop and watch. And typically, you get the largest crowd for the Pro 1-2 races, which will be in the evening, which uh, are the faster races. They're, they start at 6 p.m. They end about 8.30. It's 100 kilometers, 62 miles. And uh, that's typically where the crowd builds up. It's a first-year race, so it's speculative. We could have 500 spectators, or we could have 2,000. It, it really depends on a lot of factors. And uh, my gut feeling is probably you're, you're probably looking at 500 to 1,000 people totally. Uh, 
So, uh, but uh, we've been surprised. I mean, it, you never know. Thank you. Councilor Spector. Thank you. A couple of questions. Um, sure. And uh, Beth, I think I'll start with a couple questions for, for you. Uh, you mentioned we've been in touch with the DBA. Have they taken a position on this or any, given any feedback uh, on their thoughts? I haven't. Part of the challenging part during this process is, as you know, the DBA was without a director. And we had Crystal come to an initial meeting about two weeks ago. And Shauna just started um, today in the position. I, I think that the way when I spoke to Crystal last, she didn't feel comfortable really speaking on their behalf because if they're divided, um, you know you don't want to leave someone out it's hard to get all of the businesses together I mean even when we have had construction it's hard to get one person from every business in the same room to kind of like hash it out um, you know Walter and, and Mike have been going to businesses and you can speak to that there are um, I think there's two businesses that we've discussed um, are a little bit concerned I think it was um, Attic Quilts and some other business but um, tanning shop in the tan yes that articulated something. so the DBA has not taken a position and I you know I can't say if they even do that um, on a regular basis because this is the first time we've had sort of you can um, Walter do an update sure. on uh, all the business and property owner contacts because there's a lot more people downtown than just the retailers and the restaurant and service industry there's a lot of people that have offices <coughs> and other buildings downtown I know you've been in touch with a lot of them yeah we've been uh, going around and and have as much communication as we possibly can with a, l a number of the downtown uh, retailers and and residents and, and so forth and there should be actually a, a submitted sheet of all those businesses that are in support uh, I believe it's being circulated currently so I believe there's 20 uh, 25 n names on there so of uh, supporting uh, businesses that uh, are in support of the race so um, like I said uh, the, the largest concerns that, that we've heard from is obviously in making sure that uh, there's minimal impacts on on the downtown businesses and so I think you know working with those businesses we can make sure that we mitigate that as much as possible and hopefully like I said um, actually uh, by the initial numbers that we're thinking they're going to be visiting here in Beloit there should actually be a positive imp impact so it wouldn't be negative but it would be actually positive but hopefully like I said and having future conversations that we can help mitigate any of the the additional concerns that, that might arise so and we have more than access because we talked through today uh, some pretty neat access plans. Um, the Broad Street lot will be open and available the entire day. Uh, Mill Street will be open but intermittent. You'll be able to get in and out. The Chester Square parking lot will probably be utilized to park a lot of the participants because, again, you've got 500 participants that will be coming through, not all at once, but throughout the day. And we have the huge uh, parking lots over in the Ironworks campus. There's two huge public parking lots over there, another public parking lot on West Grand. Those will all be available for local businesses to use and also for patrons to use that are coming to the bike races uh, for the entire day. So parking is going to be a bit of an issue. Another thing we've discovered, uh, more so than uh, customers, because they will be able to get in and out. The, the races are not <laughs> constant. Uh, and you, there, there are volunteers and there will be walkways to get through the course between the races in particular to be able to move around downtown. A uh, bigger problem we discovered uh, this morning we were talking was some uh, the need to get some trucks in. Uh, there are some businesses that have deliveries. Some of them are very time sensitive. They have to get in the, uh, in a specific time frame. And I think we worked through that. We need to, to work with those individual businesses, be sure we understand when the deliveries are going to take place. Uh, before this thing goes off, hopefully we'll have the location where they're going to be allowed to cross the, the uh, route, the, uh, the uh, competition path or route and an and approximate time. So as the race concludes or as the peloton moves on and leaves that area, then the volunteers will be able to flag them across. Then they'll be in the parking lot. They can unload or, or load whatever they need to do. And then when there's another break in the race, the volunteers will flag them back across to get them across the uh, route and out of the area. So I think uh, we can work through those kinds of logistic problems. We've also, uh, we haven't talked to a lot of the merchants directly. The organizers have been handling that. But uh, one of the advantages and one of the reasons so many cities uh, 
uh, support and in some cases even sponsor these races because it brings a huge number of people into your downtown business district and it really highlights the business district not only picking up business for the event but also word of mouth again people talking about how nice your downtown area is and that's one of the things I think we will definitely benefit but certainly we would encourage any of the retailers to stay open for the day if you've got uh, customers with special needs or special issues you should address that with them they might want to come in on the Wednesday or the Friday people that don't have special access or disability access problems should be able to park in, in, in the vicinity and walk to your business plus you have all the potential of picking business up of all of the patrons all of the riders their families there will be support crews there so there will be a lot of people a lot more people in downtown than you would normally find on a weekday so again this is a first time through uh, I've seen these run once Beth has worked on a similar project in another community for what three years that you worked on these so we've seen how they can positively impact a downtown area and of course the key is working through these logistical issues to deal with the parking the truck access and customer access during the day okay. that's Luki I, th I think you've answered a lot I was going to ask you Beth if we could work with like mr. Richard Thompson here and mm -hmm. and uh, and help solve some of the concerns he has absolutely we're kind of getting into a lot of the details of it um, and that's something that staff would work um, staff and the promoters would work together I can't um, you know certainly you can cross the race of course during the race um, you know as far as um, if you know as far as accommodations for someone that may or may not be handicapped I'm not sure what we have available at this time but um, certainly we could discuss that and troubleshoot it we're, we're sort of in the beginning stages um, and so what will happen if if we're all kind of agreeing that this is a go we'll have to fast forward and just smooth out those details um, but um, there will be a lot of people downtown on there it looks day. like a tremendous plus for Beloit and if we can pull it off and, and keep people happy and keep all the businesses functioning I think if we work closely absolutely that's what the, this race is for I mean I won't speak for the promoters but when they first came to us that's what they said you know Beloit's you know we we sing our own praises all the time and this is one way to allow um, new people into our downtown and to show people all the great things we have going on so um, you know that's what it's for it's for the business owners and if they don't want it then you know that's maybe not something that we should pursue thank you for your work on this mm -hmm. thank you and uh, Councillor Kincaid uh, this looks like a great opportunity for us uh, uh, can you tell me what the uh, uh, impact might be or the need for uh, uh, extra police service uh, the traffic and the logistics um, chief was at our meeting um, today and the the way that it the way that it's worked is these are pretty I mean if anything um, worst case scenario from my experience is that if there's a crowd control would be an issue but um, typically bike races people stand along the race course and, and observe as they drive ride by and sometimes there's like um, cowbells or, or what have you um, we haven't um, the chief we don't see a need for it um, most of the most of the things that will be done will be um, closing down the race course which breakaway will do and if we post a detour there'll be another agency that's um, that that's what they do is put post detours and close roads um, like if we have a normal construction site um, chief I don't know if you want to speak or um, I don't know if we'll have a need we'll probably station someone down there just because that's where everyone will be Well, we, we would intend to have a minimal presence there as needed we would use the resources that we already have for that day unless we have information that there's going to be an exceptional crowd and we would be able to beef up our resources uh, we have some volunteer resources that we would like to post down uh, downtown also if that's as that's possible but we don't anticipate any any issues uh, the information that I heard that the uh, sounds like the organization is very well run very well organized for the race and the only thing we have to be concerned about is the ancillary uh, activities around around the race itself and outside of the course I was very very impressed with the presentation this morning thank you now once again if I may we did get into a lot of that detail this afternoon I don't want to bore you with all of the details but they have their own uh, safety coordinator who's a former police officer was a uh, an EMT and I believe still is an EMT and uh, they will be liaisoning they have radios available they will give the police and fire so we can monitor all their activities 
Uh, they provide their own medical care, so we will not dispatch an ambulance unless they have a serious injury and they need to do a transport. Otherwise, they take care of all the strawberries and stuff right on, right on, the, on, on the site. Uh, we probably will have one officer, probably a supervisor, will have that radio, will stay in the downtown, and will be uh, coordinating, liaisoning with their safety coordinator throughout the day. And that will deal with everything from race issues to problems with access to motor vehicles, uh, trying to get where they shouldn't, or crowd issues, uh, so that someone, an officer, will be there with their radio so we can stay in close touch. And then, as the chief indicated, we'll bring resources in as they're needed. They have a lot of volunteers, a lot of their own uh, security, so we don't envision that being a huge cost. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay. I've already. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Councilor Spencer. Uh, just two more quick follow ups. Uh, do we uh, know if a lot of people would be staying overnight in the community because of this, or do they typically move on in the course of the day? Um, I, I can speak with, with my experience, on, and absolutely they. I, I can't give you numbers, um, <laughs> but certainly they would stay if it's. Um, so what the, the way that it works is you have your Cat 5 rider, you have the pros at night, and then you kind of work backwards. And so if they have an early morning ride, someone will, they may stay the night before, get up, um, loosen up, you know, and then have their, their, their race and go. But what, something we had talked about earlier today is that um, we'll have to work with our local hotels. And so if we can offer, um, so if it's one of these people that, um, you know, goes race to race to race, they're going to want the best deal. And so if we can get a two-night deal or something like that, you know, we can have someone stay in Boyd even longer. But, you know, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but this isn't... Um, you know, if these cyclists are riding six, you know, 62 miles in the evening, they're going to stay somewhere. It may be halfway, but they may stay the night before. It kind of depends on, on where they are. Um, I don't think there's many cyclists that go all 14 days. Maybe there are. Um, but certainly, that would be one of the great impacts on Beloit, both downtown and um, out in the highway. I mean, we, if you can think, I can't think of a better corridor to stay in if you need to get up early and drive somewhere in Wisconsin or Illinois. Great. And then one other quick question. Uh, looking at the map, uh, obviously the post office is, is along the route. Uh, they'd have access out the other way, but sort of would have to either go right. pretty far west or through Illinois. Uh, have we checked in with them, or would they be able to get the mail delivered on time? We, we will work with the post office um, and the postmaster and make sure. Um, luckily for us, they, they do have an exit route. It's not going to be the most convenient. Um, but we will work with them. Um, Regal Boyd is aware of it. Um, and and you know, they've kind of just, we just dealt with this with Riverfest, and so um, we'll approach them and try to accommodate them the best we can. But luckily for the post office is that they are impacted, but not to the extent that some of our other businesses don't are. Don't so we'll have to work with them and do whatever it is we can do for the post office to keep them happy. Thanks. Okay, I'd like to throw in my two cents. I think we've performed our due diligence here. I think none of the uh, obstacles are insurmountable. I think this is all easy. When we bring a business to, to Beloit like uh, Paddle and Trail, this is exactly the, what we hope for them to do, is to bring people into our community, uh, commerce into our community, enhance our reputation. This is precisely what you're doing. And I want to thank you very much for that. Uh, in this case, what I can see so much pot potential for this to, to showcase who we are as Beloit. And uh, I, I think you certainly have um, my uh, earnest support for this. Uh, uh, President Haynes, are, are you going to design the jersey for uh, uh, City Manager R? <laughs> 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 I would be honored. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> we have an offer on the table to have a city heat our route between the races. So all the city officials who bike ride, I could go out and do a couple laps there in front of the crowd. So. I mean, we can that's, embarrass ourselves. That's what I'm thinking, uh, quite gentlemen. profusely there. Be a little comedic relief between the races. We have talked about it. Someone, um, oh, yeah. one of them said that Trek has, uh, I don't remember which one of the guys said, to, but they've um, spoken with Trek and that they have some extra, um, we could have like a big wheel race or something. Certainly that's, those are the things we'll get into um, as we move forward, but we just wanted you to be aware, and certainly the downtown businesses, to be aware. Um, President Haynes, I don't think I would say it was easy <laughs> by any means. There will be a lot of work to be done in the meantime, but um, certainly I, I'm willing to help in any way that I can.
I do have access to a tandem tricycle. What about that? I've never heard of such. That would be <laughs> interesting if I could like see it. two toddlers on a tandem. <laughs> We're going to go to City Hall and put it on display. But I do uh, I thank the council. I think that's what we wanted to do. We had not had an opportunity prior today to meet uh, the organizers who actually run the business. We had been dealing with Walter and Michael. Uh, and so that was very helpful for us. And I think the conversation tonight was also very helpful to be sure that counselors are comfortable with this. We've had an opportunity to answer your questions. Again, we have a lot of work left. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll be pressing forward over the next several weeks to get all these details polished out. Okay. Well, and one thing I just want to mention real quick is that um, if this this contract that goes through it is a it is a three year commitment. It's not necessarily a three year commitment to this route, although that's that would be ideal. Um, but the thing is that the way that these kind of races work and the way Super Week works, if you research it, is that it, every year it's supposed to get bigger and better. And, and by that it means it's, it'll be run smoother in, in, in the future. And so that's something that, you know, we're hoping to look forward to and maybe this can, you know, keep us on the map, keep people coming to Beloit. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, certainly like it's not the route necessarily, although that's the goal of the promoters that it would stay in Beloit on this day. Thank you. I think uh, I don't see any consternation on any of our parts. So, uh, you know, you certainly have our, uh, our our support in this. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. With that being done let's we're going to start with item 11 reports from boards and city officers a resolution authorizing an amended <clears throat> and restated cooperative agreement authorizing the issuance and sale of one million six hundred and sixty five thousand dollars in redevelopment lease revenue bonds series 2012 a and series 2012 a municipal revenue obligation and the execution of related documents and authorizing an amended and restated public property lease and contribution agreement. Mr. York. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to uh, offer to cover uh, both A and B in one staff report. They're somewhat related. Okay. And uh, we do have with us this evening our uh, financial advisor, uh, Don Gunderson with Ellers. And she's really here to give the details of both uh, bond sales uh, that occurred this morning. Uh, we did have uh, two sales uh, that we had this morning. One was the uh, CDA lease revenue bonds. Uh, these are going to be used to help finance uh, projects that we have in our tax increment district number five, which is the downtown TIF. Uh, the CDA did meet uh, earlier this evening and uh, they did hold a public hearing on these bonds and they also approved uh, the issuance uh, of the bonds and the sale that occurred earlier today. Um, the second uh, issue is a uh, general obligation issue. Uh, this includes uh, funding for not only capital improvement projects that are in the CIP this year for the city, but there's also a refunding component uh, to this particular uh, issue. Uh, we're refunding uh, some outstanding debt that the city currently has uh, in hopes uh, to save uh, interest costs with lower interest rates on those uh, bonds. Um, we did receive uh, very good rates uh, this morning uh, as a result of the uh, current financial market. And uh, we are expecting to save, uh, I think, fairly substantially more than we expected uh, when we looked at preliminary numbers a month or so ago. Uh, when the council initially uh, or approved the initial resolutions to issue uh, the debt. And with that, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Don Gunnarsson with Ellers. Uh, and again, she will uh, cover the uh, details of the uh, sale that took place this morning. Don? Thank you, Paul. Good evening. <coughs> You've been provided with a packet of material copies of the resolutions that you'll be considering this evening for both issues and so result packets for each of the issues. Uh, first I will address the community development lease revenue bonds, uh, the sale result of this morning's negotiated issue uh, with 1665000 of redevelopment lease revenue bonds. This was negotiated with Baird out of Milwaukee. Uh, we've used them due to their 
market exposure and their ability to place these issues. They've got a, a large client base in the state of Wisconsin with cd revenue bonds. If they're bought by investors who pay Wisconsin taxes, the interest earnings that they receive on the um, investment is both exempt from taxation on a federal level because of a tax exempt financing and also uh, state of Wisconsin taxes. So Baird has is, is, um, historically been able to place these quite well with favorable interest rates and um, we believe that that is the case in this issue as well. The packet of material that you have on this issue includes the Moody's Investors Service rating report. These bonds are rated with Moody's Investor Service with an A3 rating, which certainly assists in uh, the, the interest rates obtained on the issue. The report is there. Uh, it is on the first seven pages, so please take the time to read that. Uh, page eight of this report is the interest rates on the issue. Uh, it's a rather short issue. Your tax income in district number five concludes its expenditure period in September of this year. Uh, once that arrives, there are no ability to take on additional projects or financing for that district. This, With this financing, um, the each maturity holds an interest rate. Those rates range between 0.8% and 1.82%. Uh, the overall TIC interest rate on, is the average interest rate, and the underwriter um, discount is 1.9866%. To give you a perspective of that, when we were here a month ago with our planning estimates, we were sizing this issue with a 2.33 TIC rate. So this is uh, lower than the initial planning estimates when we were authorized to proceed with the sale. The comparative numbers in terms of interest cost as a result of the, uh, the financing, our planning estimates had the interest at $150,518. These actual interest rates will result in an uh, interest cost over the um, entire life of the issue if, if it's held to that maturity of 124821 uh, With this issue and the other obligations that exist in the tax increment district, your tax increment district 5 has development, is, is collecting approximately uh, $1.1 million of increment on an annual basis. Its ability to cover its existing debt and this debt would still close out one year early of its statutory life in 2017 with funds available for redistribution back to the overlapping taxing districts once all the debt is retired. So the details of that are on page 9 and um, 10. Uh, we've also included a uh, municipal bond buyer index to show you the, the the interest rates over the last 12-month period. Uh, in February of this year, that bond buyer index hit its, its low, historical low over the last 35 years at 3.6. Those rates are at 3.77. So the timing of the sale uh, patterned quite well within the, uh, um, the historical interest rates. So that's the results of this sale. I'm glad to answer any questions on that before we move to the general obligation issue. That's a random bogart. Any other questions? No. Okay. Any other questions on this one? Okay, I think you're ready to proceed with this. Okay. Present. The other half of the packet of material includes the resolution for the general obligation corporate purpose bonds and also the sale report packet, which I'll uh, review with you now. We went to market this morning. This particular issue we, we did as a competitive bond issue. General obligation is, is uh, you know, it's a standard financing. Um, the official statement went out. We took competitive bids at 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, in this packet, you will also see a, a uh, rating report. The city holds a bond rating with standard and pours. The rating report is in, included in here. We had a conference call with them a week ago. The city has um, obtained and been affirmed with their A-plus rating with uh, Standard Poor's. This is on this issue and all of the outstanding debt that the city currently has in place. So um, take the time again to read that rating report. It, it also is, is reflective of the, uh, the good rates that you received on um, this issue. 
So on page six of the packet of material is the bid tabulation. As I mentioned, we went to market to issue $7,355,000 of general obligation corporate purpose bonds for, for the purpose of financing your 2012 capital projects and to refinance two outstanding obligations, a general obligation of, from 2006 and a state trust fund loan that had a Build America bond rebate um, issued in 2009. We received three bids. Bosk Inc., a subsidiary of Bank of Oklahoma out of Menominee Falls, was the winning bid. They're ranked in the order of most favorable bid based upon the true interest rate, which is the average interest rate, and the um, uh, net underwriter discount and a reoffering premium. The true interest rate from Bosk was 2.5746 followed by a bid from Piper Jaffray in Minneapolis, 2.5999, and Baird out of Milwaukee at 2.6971. So the, the tabulation includes those three bids. And uh, with the results of the low bid, we were able to accomplish a couple of things. Um, because of the, the reoffering premium that was placed on the bids, we were able to cover some of the issuance costs, the underwriter discount, and reduce the amount needed for our refinancing. We actually are issuing and awarding the sale of a lower amount at $7,240,000. So we were be able to downsize that issue by $115,000. So the resolution you're adopting this evening will be for that lower amount. With that um, reduced issue size and um, uh, we'll recap the difference then between our planning estimates for the cost of this issue and the financing today when we were here a month ago authorizing this on page 9 you'll see that um, our planning estimates the bottom of the left hand corner were um, for the new money and the refinancing that principal and interest of 9.4 million with today's sale it's just under 9.1 million, so there's a difference of about 318000 So that's less interest and less expense to the city by that amount to do this, to accomplish the same goals. To break that out in terms of the, the components, on page 10, uh, our cost to issue f the debt for the street projects is 127000 less than our planning estimates. The park and public grounds is about 15000 less. Your fire um, equipment is about 25,000 less and an additional savings to the refunding portion of 150,000. So that's the 318,000 lower amount of, of overall principal and interest cost. But to then focus on the actual refinancing, as I said, a big piece of this was to refinance current outstanding debt and take advantage of the low interest rates and utilize some real savings dollars to the city. So on page 11, this is a consolidation of the two refinancings. As I mentioned earlier, we were, we were refinancing a 2006 general obligation bond and a state trust fund bond. So the, the column to focus on here is to the far right, which, is, which breaks out the savings on an annual basis. And beginning in 2013, you'll see that there's a $27,000 savings. That's savings of existing debt you have outstanding that you'll be able to um, uh, realize next year and then each year going forward that number ranges between that 27,000 and about 13,000 at the later years on the longer refinanced. The difference between our, when we, we chose to move forward with this, we were estimating um, about a 2.3 percent savings the com combination. We realized over a 6 percent savings on this. So um, on in future dollars, it's about $272,000 that the, the city will save. Bringing that to a net, net present value, it's $216,000 in today's dollar. Uh, our estimates, that number was at $84,000. So that picks up an additional $132,000 of net present value savings by undertaking these two refinancings. The next two schedules break that out by issue. Um, the greatest savings, obviously, is in the, the longer term issue, which is a 2006. Uh, that on an average annual basis is about $17,000 on an annual basis on an average between 2013 and 2026. Um, again, there's a, a, about $130,000 savings on this issue alone, and the state trust fund BAB net of the rebate um, is another 
three to eight thousand dollars on an annual basis between thir 2013 and 2019. So um, here, that's about the little net present value, a little lower. This is a current refinancing, and it's still savings on an annual basis to the city. Again, I've attached that same chart as the previous issue, so um, the timing of this hit a, 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 a very nice low in the, in the interest rate for the market. So uh, maximizing the savings um, on the refinancing. So glad to answer any questions you may have on this issue as well. A couple of questions, Ms. Gunderson. First, yes. um, refresh my memory. Uh, I thought that the state trust fund uh, and, and the incentive with the Build America bonds were not callable so quickly. How did the, how did that work? How did we <coughs> save the money with the Build America bonds kickback of the 35 percent or 45 percent interest? How did that work? The the you had a fixed rate with the Build America bonds that you were paying, and then you were getting a 35 percent rebate. So there was a net cost to you. Um, the, because it was issued through the state trust fund, it has the same prepayment opportunity that any state trust fund loan. What will happen now is with these lower interest rates, the net cost of interest is actually still lower than it was after the rebate was applied on that existing issue. So it's net the rebate, so the savings we were comparing is after the rebate was applied. What will happen now is the proceeds from this issue will pay off your state trust fund. You will no longer be applying for the, the rebate from um, the IRS because that will go away with that loan, and you will still be realizing a savings on an annual basis with the lower interest rates on this. So interest rates have dropped down that we're actually benefiting from, even with that 35 percent rebate at a lower cost to the city okay okay that was my that was my main question thank you Councilor Lukey uh, Don I just wanted to explain to the public that earlier this afternoon you met with the entire community development authority board Correct. and they unanimously accepted this report that you and mr. York gave and then earlier prior to this meeting you met with the entire council and um, explained how we have very favorable interest rates on the, the community development one and uh, as well yes so I want to thank you for the time you spent with us today thank you any other council comments or questions hearing none I believe we have a we're going to need to do a, a roll call vote um, let's do a motion we can take a motion we have approval of 11a Okay, motion by Spitzer, second by Lukey. Okay, um, Kincaid. Spitzer. Yes. Haynes. Aye. Lukey. Aye. Vanda Bogart. Okay, the record shows that all five um, are in support. And for the $7,240,000 of general obligation bond, get them. Motion by Lukey, second by uh, Vanda Bogart. Okay. Kincaid. Aye. Spritzer. Aye. Haynes. Aye. Lukey. Aye. Vanda Bogart. Aye. Okay, the record shows all five. Uh, motion carries with all five voting in favor. All right. Uh, we have next uh, 11C, resolution adopting the 2013 City of Beloit Strategic Plan, New York. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> really a very brief uh, presentation. We did, uh, as you recall, meet with the council uh, last month. We had an all-day workshop where uh, each department had the opportunity to present uh, their strategic plan for 2013 to the council. Um, as best I can recall, there were very few changes uh, that were made to the department presentations. I believe we did make uh, some minor adjustments uh, to the goals uh, for next year, the strategic goals that the council sets. Uh, the strategic plan is incorporated in the budget uh, for the ensuing uh, fiscal year and uh, we'll, we're in the process now of putting that uh, document together, or at least the beginning stages of that. and. I'm sure all the departments will be considering their strategic objectives when they compile their budgets for next year. Um, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions the council may have regarding the strategic planning process or uh, the actual document that's uh, being proposed for adoption this evening. 
we have a motion to approve? Absolutely. Okay, motion by Van Bogart, second by Kincaid. Councilor Spicer. I just wanted to note for anybody who's watching uh, that even though there isn't really any discussion here on this tonight, uh, that we did go through an all-day workshop and, and spent quite a bit of time together with uh, all of the department heads as well as other city staff uh, working through uh, page by page over 100 pages of the strategic plan. So even though it looks like we're about to probably unanimously pass something without any discussion here tonight that, that governs the entire next year. Uh, there was a full uh, day's work that went into that that builds upon years and years of foundations of day's work uh, setting up the previous strategic plans that, that carry forward. So just wanted to make sure the public is aware that, that this really is uh, one of the days every year that we have a chance to ask questions about just about anything and talk about uh, almost anything going on in the city in terms of operating procedures and, and practices, staffing, uh, and those lines and so uh, it was quite a full discussion uh, and a full day's work and and that's why we're here tonight without a whole lot to say for not a whole lot to say you managed to <laughs> 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 uh, okay any other uh, qu qu comments or uh, questions all right I'll call the matter uh, all in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed matter passes uh, five zero now, finally, we are moving on to 11D. And Gerard, you're going to vote the council, or, or the, uh, Mr. Flesh is going to handle this. <laughs> a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a memorandum of agreement between the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, Rock County, and the city of Beloit pertaining to proposed improvements to County uh, Highway G, Inman Parkway extension, and the use of Gateway Boulevard and Cranston Road for incident management and congestion management for the Interstate Highway 3990, um, that construction. Thank you. The title in itself is almost a report. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me on that one. To make it short is the state of Wisconsin during the construction of I-3990 is looking for alternative ways of handing, handling congestion and incident management if there's an accident. Um, that would potentially close a portion of the interstate between uh, State Trunk Highway 11 and the state line. The routes that they came up with are Highway G and the Inman Parkway extension that will be constructed prior to the uh, start of the construction of the interstate. Um, the use of Gateway Boulevard from Illinois 75 north to the Hart Road interchange and a portion of Cranston Road from Gateway Boulevard to State Trunk Highway 81. Those are their desires. Um, there's a couple of little deals or side deals that go with this. We have prior commitments for the construction with the state and the Rock County on Inman Parkway extension. Our commitments to that have, um, will be moving forward and the state will be covering 70% of the costs of those construction issues. If they deem to need traffic signals at Collie Road and Gateway and uh, State Highway 67, there will be discussions as to the cost participation, if any. Um, they're in hopes that we are in hopes that they will cover 100% of those costs too. This not only will run for authorization during construction, but post construction in case there's severe accidents, um, bad weather, whatever that would potentially close the interstate and would ask us to you know leave it as an alternate route. So we're asking you to allow the city manager to enter this agreement. Questions? We have a uh, motion to approve. Absolutely. Any second? Second. Councilor Spitzer. Uh, and Councilor Van Bogart. Several questions, Mr. Fleisch. First of all, I would say if, not when, there are accidents and congestion. Secondly, are the is, is the load that's going to be carried on these roads in excess of their design capacity? Are they going to be all beat to rubble by this? increased activity and if so what reimbursement are we going to get from the state and what other alternatives were looked at and what if we just said no we don't want to do this we can say no all right then what happened i mean i, I then met, they I'm have to come up with a different plan uh, there wasn't really much alternative um broadway corridors that would probably just put them all through downtown city of Beloit on highway 51. Okay. that that would be the next best option where they don't need to ask for any permissions. Mm -hmm. um, it is felt that with the state rebuilding, 
uh, paying 70% of the rebuild for Highway G and participating in the cost of Inman Parkway that those designs are for this type of roadway to handle those loadings capacities. Uh, Gateway Boulevard was designed as an industrial corridor, industrial arterial almost as a, a, a is almost like a misnomer because there's not a lot of other streets out there yet but in time it was designed to be an industrial arterial it can handle it it's a nine inch pavement very similar to the interstate a similar structure so it can handle it um, I don't anticipate there being any beat to death issues with the intermittent use that it will have okay what is the is in, be incurred the 30 percent if life 13 14 um in the staff report for inman parkway and that's what i forgot to put in there is the inman parkway little title in there um our local portion is 10 percent of the 30 percent local uh you know one third of the 30 percent local so uh, we agreed to the, because that's the length within the city and that's why we were invited into this one with Inman Parkway because a portion of that corridor was within the city also. Highway G, the portion they're talking about, will be at the north city limits and is under the jurisdiction of the um, Rock County. So we would not participate in any of the Highway G costings. You want to know the dollar value too? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> When, when do we pay our 10 percent we will pay it over a couple of year period at the time of construction um they anticipate having construction start um in possibly late 2014 with completion in 2015 so we'd be paying it over a 2014 15 and possibly 16 year period you know, years right now those costs are all estimates anyway aren't they yes they are okay <laughs> best, best educated guesses at this point any other? Oh, to, to your knowledge, Mr. Flesh, has a uh, has a uh, pathway been established for Inman Parkway yet, or is it still under negotiations, discussion, and bone of contention with the various parties? It's in the final design review phases of the environmental uh, and design study report. Um, we would expect an announcement from the design consultants that are hired by the state and the county uh, within the next little bit on a recommended corridor thank you all right with no further uh, questions or comments uh, all the better all in favor say aye aye any opposed but matter passes uh, five zero next is uh, item 11 e a resolution to approve the compliance maintenance annual report from 2011. Good evening. Uh, my name is Harry Mathis. I am the operations supervisor uh, and director of water resources um, for the city of Beloit. And what you have before you tonight is called the compliance maintenance annual report. And what the, what the purpose of the report is, is to provide not only the ratepayers of the city of Beloit, but also the governing body to um, to, to, to view and to see just exactly what's going on um, out at your wastewater treatment plant. It serves as a report card. Uh, it's required by the DNR each year uh, for every wastewater plant in the, in the state of Wisconsin. And it basically serves as a report card uh, for your wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it's a scale, basically, as you would any report card in school, 4.0 being the highest. And this year, again, we scored a 4.0. What they look at are operations, maintenance, collections, uh, finance, um, and overall operation of your wastewater treatment plant. So again, it's a score. Um, we we'll do it annually, and again, once again, I'm very proud to say we scored a 4.0. And again, that's a testament. As anytime I've stood up here and talked about the wastewater treatment plan and the, and the staff we have out there, it's a testament to their hard work and dedication. This is last month. I celebrated my 30th anniversary with the city of Beloit in the wastewater treatment field. So I know where we came from, and I know where we are. And I'm personally very proud of what we've done. So I remember standing up here in 1990 at this very podium, talking to the council and encouraging them to allow us to run that wastewater treatment plant that we now have. So I'm very proud to stand in front of you, telling you. Again, Again, that we have a 4.0 grade point average if you will so with that I'd, I'll take questions in the, in the minutia of the report uh, are there any looming issues that we need to look at uh, 
I know we have spent some money in the, in the water area with uh, the new well and the mixing and nitrate issues, um, but is there anything in there in terms of either heavy metals or, or organic compounds or whatever it might be that uh, we should be aware of that might, that might explode? I know we got the, the phosphorus issue that's out there that's, that's lurking around, uh, right. but right. Um, um, is there anything in here that we should uh, be concerned about? Not at this time, no. There isn't anything within this document that we should be concerned about. But again, as you mentioned, um, phosphorus is the next current issue on our radar. We will begin dealing with that within the next um, permit cycle, which um, our current permit ends in 2014. So we will begin uh, basically a compliance schedule uh, through the DNR to bring us up to uh, the, 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 the next um, uh, criteria. We're doing well right now. Right now, if we had to uh, meet the, per the, the limits that they, that they plan on uh, setting forth in the next anywhere from 48 years, we would meet those limits right now with what we're doing. However, what we're going to have to do is create ourselves sort of a buffer, if you will. So when they lower those limits to where they're going to be, or th at the level they're going to be, we're going to need a little bit of a buffer. Right now, our limit is two, what's called two parts per million. That's going to drop to roughly around uh, 0.4 parts per million, which is where we're at right now. However, we're going to have to build ourselves a little buffer. And um, I've been discussing this issue with several consulting firms and, and professional colleagues I have throughout the state, and everybody's in the same boat. We're all doing the same thing at the same time. Um, but there's a lot of, I don't want to say easy answers, because that's that's uh, never a good thing to say, but there are, there are answers for this. We will meet it. Um, and I'm looking forward to the challenge. Any comments? thought of changing the direct application of the sludge drying concepts or some of these other things that are being kicked around? Yeah, well, we currently, we just completed a, uh, a project at the wastewater plant. In fact, we went online in January of this year where we're taking our, our biosolids, where before we would land apply liquid biosolids. We're still applying liquid uh, biosolids to the local agricultural community, but we're also taking a portion of that right now and removing more water. So basically, we're drying it a little more. Um, uh, Mr. Arf talked to me a month or so ago, looking at you know where are we going to go with this? How much further can we go? And of course, you can dry it up to about 95 percent, basically like coffee grounds, and that in turn can be sold on the market, si similar to millorganite, which is very popular and been used for for countless years. So ultimately, would that be a, a, a goal? Yes, but that takes a lot of money. So those are those are goals and uh, monetary issues that we have to discuss in the future. But uh, we're we're at a good point right now. We what I hope to do was to set the table for the next 20 years at that wastewater plant. I think we are right now. The phosphorus issue that's the next one we have to deal with. But as far as the solids and biosolids, I think we're good um, for at least another 10 years. But then uh, we also have to look maybe take that to the next step. What we've done is there's three steps. We're at step B right now. Then we can take the, to step C, maybe at, in, in the next phase. Thank you. Hmm? Any other questions or comments? Well, thank right, you. Sir. Thank you. Item 11F. We get a motion and a second. Oh, do we use a resolution to accept? Okay. Yes. Excuse me. All right. So um, we have a motion to approve because I don't think I took so, a motion. So move, Mr. President. Second. Okay. okay. Motion by uh, Magnu Bogart, second by Lubke. All in favor say aye. Aye. And any opposed? Motion passes uh, 5 0. All right, finally, uh, 11F. A resolution approving the agreement between the City of Beloit and the Beloit Su Police Supervisory Association, BPSA. <coughs> Mr. President and uh, counselors, this is the last uh, labor agreement um, that was under negotiation for the what we refer to now as the biennial budget process of 2000. 12 and 13. Uh, this agreement was is with the Beloit Police Supervisory uh, Association, which in, in essence is the police sergeants. Uh, this is actually a meet and confer relationship, which is slightly different from the formal collective bargaining. However, the end result is, is usually to produce the same type of written document that you have before you this evening that talks about wages and working conditions and benefits for our police department supervisors. As you undoubtedly already noted from reading through the staff report and the attached summary, uh, this agreement parallels very closely the agreements that we earlier concluded with the police officers and the firefighters. We have removed some language from this agreement that we believe is in uh, violation of the final language in the state's uh, biennial budget. 
uh, related to plan design, um, which is now exclusively a management right. And as we did with the other bargaining units, there's a qualifier in there should the courts later determine otherwise uh, that, that some of that language would be reinstated at a future time. Uh, also, we've built in the same type of uh, transition to the police supervisors paying the employee portion of the Wisconsin retirement system, again, modeled on what we did in the other two collective bargaining agreements. Effective the 24th of May, the supervisors will begin contributing 3% of their uh, salary toward the pension contribution. Concurrent with that, they will also receive a 3% salary adjustment beginning January 1 of 2013. The supervisors, along with all the other employees, including all the public safety employees, will contribute the WRS mandated employee contribution for that particular program year. And uh, as with the other public safety employees, the police supervisors will receive a 2.75% salary increase effective uh, January 1, 2013, to offset the cost of their pension uh, withholding. Might also note on wages that uh, we, we brought you an agreement earlier with the police officers that created or added some steps to the top of the schedule. The police sergeants automatically get the benefit of that because their schedule is tied into the officer's schedule to maintain a certain gap, if you will, in the wages between the line and the supervisory employees. So they will benefit from an additional adjustment in their pay schedule uh, equal to about 2.6% as a result of those scheduling adjustments. When we costed that out, that costed out very, very similar to the uh, con contractual agreements we did with the police officers and the firefighters. So we think we have internal consistency here and uh, relatively fair uh, distribution of benefits and salary. Again, uh, commensurate with what was given the public safety uh, employees. Of course, there were no similar benefits afforded uh, the uh, general uh, workforce. Uh, if there are any questions by counselors about the negotiated settlement, I'd be happy to answer those at this time. We first will want a motion to approve. Motion for approval. Second. We'll keep motions and Spicer seconds. Okay, any questions or comments? Councilor Spicer. Uh, just one question. Uh, certainly looks like a, a fair agreement in line with the other agreements we've approved. Uh, could you just clarify where the money is coming from to pay for this cost? As with the other agreements, we appropriated in the 2012 budget the entire cost for the employee's pension contribution. Uh, between the fire and police departments, it was a little over a quarter of a million dollars. So the money is already appropriated in the budget. What's going to happen is it shifts from the pension contribution line to the salary line. But the money is already included in the budget. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Seeing and hearing none, I'll move for the matter. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Five zero. And finally, item 12, adjournment. <coughs> Councilor Van de Bogard? Second. <laughs> Second by Spicer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great job, gentlemen. Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, then. Uh, we, we, we are adjourned. Oh, cool.